All right. So I'm going to go, on ahead, go ahead and dampen this top piece here so I can make it a little bit more malleable. See how smoothly this goes. So, go around and do a little hammering. Then I'll use some clothes pins as well. I'll just go around it, clamp everything I can, and I'll let this sit probably overnight and go from there. That, that, that one glued up nicely, so carry on with the other one. Okay, next up, um, while these are setting up, I'm going to go ahead and, and cement the thong together and give that time some, give that some time to, to dry, and uh, I'll cement that in place. And then after it dries, I'll come through and I'll use my awl to punch through my through my previously punched holes through the rest of the thong. So I'll go ahead and get that cemented and clamped in place. Another uh, tip I have for you. Uh, I read this online on a forum. Um, if you use silicone paintbrushes, you can use them for cementing. And then after the cement dries, you can just peel it off. And when you're doing pre precision gluing like this, you want to use a, a brush instead of what it came with. It's just too much, so just a little bonus tip for you. Now we're going to start to see where the strap length kind of comes into into play uh, because of how you want this to actually look when it's resting. Uh, this this particular layout I've done is going to be fairly tight, but I think once it breaks in, it'll be just fine. So uh, wherever we cement it is where it's going to be. You have a little bit of adjustability by going up and down, but uh, if you go all the way up, it's going to be pretty tight. So I'll probably just go about halfway up the strap on this particular pair and see how that works out. So I'm going to let these set, and then I'll clamp them, let them dry. Okay, so I wanted to discuss something real quick. Um, before you get too far into the process, I, I highly recommend making a full paper pattern on your first pair and, and just trying them out on your feet. You can actually use quite a bit of tape and make your pattern durable enough to where you can put it on your feet and just make sure that it kind of works, uh, that it's not too tight, not too stressed and uh, you don't stretch your materials too hard and uh, as an example I'm trying to figure out what size thong to use on these flip-flops and I've had to make a little bit longer um, 
pattern than I'm that I typically do just because of the way I laid this out but uh, you know if you make them out of paper you tape them underneath the flip-flop like just like you would sew them then you at least have an idea of if it's possible for the flip-flop to come together um, my last size that I used was a 7 inch and it was amazing how much different um, it was going to fit up but you know when you move things around from sh from foot to foot you know if one person has a fairly slender foot you can kind of stay consistent but on this particular pair the front end is extremely wide and uh, kind of kind of short because it's an eight and a half men's size length but yet a size 10 wide so that kind of makes it just different so you know anyway I recommend having a few different paper patterns of that 90 degree angle and uh, you can try different ones out and if it works in paper it's probably gonna work just fine in leather so just wanted to show that to you especially if you haven't Especially if you haven't done this before, uh, paper pattern is a huge, a huge. Uh, especially if you haven't done this before, paper pattern is a huge help. So, I recommend trying that out. Okay, so uh, I've actually ended up having to uh, change the strap out on this pair. Uh, what I typically do is a seven-inch strap, and I didn't really like the way that it kind of stressed and pulled up on the rear, and uh, I just didn't like it. It looked like they were kind of in a bind. So I went ahead and, and tried a few different strap sizes, and, and seven and a half seemed like the sweet spot, so that's what I've gone with. And I've gone ahead and cemented the uh, the thong center to the top strap. And uh, what I've done in the past is uh, punch the holes through the strap, and I already have the holes punched on the front thong. And uh, I would just cement them together and then use some needles to kind of align things. And this time I decided to just punch the holes in the front thong, and then after I cemented it in place, I would just maybe use my Dremel to uh, drill my lacing holes. I thought I could use my uh, my awl to do that, but it, it's just really awkward and it would take a good deal of force to get it through with a liner. Or at least it appears that way, just for me trying to do it. But uh, I'll go ahead and just use my, dr my drill. It, it's not a, a problem to do that. So the cement's been sitting for a little while and uh, I'll use the drill to uh, drill the holes out and then I'll get this sewed up. And uh, we'll move on to getting the profile of the shoe ground down to the line that I've drawn. And that's a new bit on my drill and it's a it says 1.2 on my little Dremel set it's a very tiny it's smaller than my sewing needle and uh, so it'll probably have a little bit of friction pushing that through but the main reason the all wouldn't work is um, I just couldn't put the right amount of pressure on it and if I did put an adequate amount of pressure on it I'd likely just destroy my my glue joint entirely so it didn't seem like it would be worth the trouble and that seems like this is going to work pretty well. This is an awkward angle. This is not a fun spot to sew. But uh, it can be done. The pliers will come in handy to help, especially on the first stitch or two. And you want to always be thorough with your sewing. You want to make sure you backstitch as much as you possibly can and do all the preventative type sewing to make sure all your joints are good and when you're fighting angles like this it's kind of discouraging to want to go back and do it you know as well as you should because you just want to get it over with but yeah I learned quite a bit on this pair of flip-flops because this particular pattern ended up being kind of wide compared to what I've done in the past. Probably a little more off standard width than the average foot. And so uh, I didn't expect the, uh, the issue with the strap that I ran into. That was a surprise to me. So the, what that tells me is it's 
always best to do as much of a mock-up as you possibly can because it will take you a few minutes to do the mock-up but it could save you the I don't know how many days uh, this it cost me a couple days of work to uh, correct the problem because I had to disassemble the shoe back down to bare bones really and uh, fix the strap that way and it's there's no other way to do it the good thing is that it was repairable I didn't it's always the worst when you mess up the sole because of the amount of leather that you lose I don't do that very often but it is possible that's why custom footwear is just a tricky thing custom what anything that you wear is tricky because people are so different I could make a pair of flip-flops for a guy and and uh, I get everything that I need and then he gets them and uh, turns out his foot is three times thicker than you know an average person's and then I have to figure out how to correct that and I'm not making so much off these flip-flops to where it's worth the admin and returns and back and forth to just have to fix stuff constantly. It just isn't worth it. But anyway, just something to consider. Even something simple or seemingly simple like making belts for people. That was, making belts was probably one of the first times I made specifically sized items for people. And it was always a challenge. Just things like some people just don't understand how to measure themselves and they don't do it correctly and you told them how to do it and maybe they didn't do it quite right or didn't understand how important it was to be as exact as possible and so as a maker it kind of ends up being your problem even, even if you did everything you should do at the very least you end up with a question you have to ask yourself of you know how do you proceed? <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and sew this all the way around and then double back and do it again and it will be solid. Some of you guys wanted some detailed videos because you just really wanted more information and this should be plenty. Now, I don't know how well you can see what I'm doing here, but I've started here, did my back stitch, and I'm just slowly working away around. And uh, you do have, if you're as, as you're designing and sizing your flip-flops, you do have a little bit of forgiveness on the thong and you can actually choose how high you want it to be. And that can give you quite a bit of play. It's just uh, if the length of the strap is off, you can't make up for that. What I ended up doing is making a bunch of patterns of different strap lengths that I'll just have all the time. I've got paper ones and leather ones, and they range from 6 inches to 9 inches in increments of a half inch between because the half inch size does seem to make a difference. And uh, just going forward, I'll... I'll I'll see what looks like it works, and I'll have a measurement of toe height between the, the user's big toe and second toe in between those. And that should help me uh, eliminate a lot of problems, I hope. There we go. I'll do a back stitch on this, and sew the other one up, and then we will move on. And some people ask, how long does it take you to make a pair of flip-flops? I, I usually, I'll spend a long weekend and I can get a pair done. But if I make one mistake and have to backtrack, it takes me twice as long. So anywhere between two and four days is pretty, pretty safe. Two if everything go, goes perfectly, and four if... It doesn't, so. But there you have it. I'm going to move that last lace through here. 
cut it on the back and and uh, melt it on the back side. So there we have it. Okay, so I have taken my shoes to the grinder and ground down to my lines that I plan to uh, go by. In my video, you've if you've watched my videos, you've seen me use it. It's a, a grizzly grinder with a 10 inch wheel and I just roughly grind down to my drawn edges. There's really nothing to be gathered from my technique. It's pretty straightforward. You just carefully grind down to your finest lines. And if you get some really tight nooks and crannies, you can actually use a, uh, a Dremel tool with a sanding drum on it. I have one right here. I don't know if I can get it in the shot because it's mounted. But I uh, have this. It's a Dremel tool. I think it's actually called a... Um, pneumatic carver or something like that. You can get them at Harbor Freight. They're actually a variable speed and have a pedal to power them. And that works pretty well with a little sanding drum on it. Bigger would be better. And uh, you could just use your regular Dremel too, but that thing's pretty powerful and I like the variable speed. And then after that, I'll just go back and use my um, round sanding block. It's a Dura block with some paper on it. And I'll just get a nice, smooth, flat, sanded edge all the way around and then we'll go through and uh, mark our stitching lines and then we'll round off the edges and do a burnishing so at this point i'm just trying to knock all those rough grinding lines off and uh, i'll spare you the video on that and then we'll have a nice matching profile to uh, proceed with so i've sanded down the edges gotten pretty close to my profile i like and you can see my pencil line hidden under that little lip and uh I'll probably mark my my uh, stitching groove first before I knock that off. And uh, you kind of get a bit of a rollover on the bottom lip from the grinder. Or at least I do in my grinder. You may not in yours or however you decide to do this. You don't even have to use a grinder if you just cut really close. And that would probably be the best long-term solution and something that I'm going to strive for. The less machine the better I think maybe not in the case of sewing because I'm, the way I do it, it's not as you've seen it's very time consuming and probably not very practical long term but I don't know maybe if I do it a few thousand hours I'll get really fast Do that to the other shoe and then move on okay I feel like I'll go ahead and do my beveling I think the edge is tall enough to where I can do this now on small items you don't want to cut the sharp edge off I don't think until you've uh, I feel like on smaller items, thinner leather, you want to make sure that you keep your edges sharp before you mark your stitching lines because it can really make the tool react oddly. So yeah, there we have it. That's what it looks like after we've just done a real simple beveling. Use my flat beveler.
If you're new to beveling, definitely check out my how to sharpen your beveler video. Makes a huge difference when it's nice and sharp. It gets really jerky on the cut if you don't have it nice and sharp. So I'll go ahead and mark my I'll go ahead and wet this a little bit, I think, and then mark my stitching groove. 